Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Brown. I'm the Vice President for Advancement, and welcome to today's presidential lecture series titled The Oscars and a Hidden History, Hollywood Legend Hattie McDaniel by best-selling author Rashonda Tate. And Rashonda, let me just say, we've been very excited once we heard that you were gonna be our, our featured speaker, so we're very excited for you to be here, as well as your husband, Jeff, and, and your sister as well. So thank you so much for being here. And I know that uh, Deborah will also be doing a, a little more about Rashonda, so. Uh, it's an honor to work alongside President Blanchard and other esteemed UHD colleagues to produce these very important events every semester. Today's presentation is being held in honor and observance of Black History Month, which aims to celebrate historical milestones and achievements of African Americans all around the world. As many of you know, these presidential lectures are part of a series of discussions that bring together the university community to reflect on topics that are relevant and important to all we serve. The University of Houston downtown prides itself on being an institution where ideas and perspectives are welcomed and shared. So I know we've got a few more students that are coming in and more attendees, so they'll be, we're gonna leave the doors slightly open so they have a chance to come in. Uh, but also, y'all were handed a ticket coming in, so hold on to that. We've got a little announcement before uh, uh, you uh, uh, exit today. So again, hold on to that ticket, don't lose it, and uh, we'll have more information later. So again, to officially bring us greetings, please welcome the president of the University of Houston downtown, Dr. Lauren J. Blanchard. see that uh, Jay has uh, built the suspense with the tickets. So it's, you get a car and you get a car and <laughs> no, that won't happen. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon and certainly uh, a great pleasure to join you here today for the 16th installment of the University of Houston Downtown's President's Lecture Series. And this is the first installment of the 50th year anniversary. So we're really excited uh, to kick us off in this kind of way. Um, I'm Lauren Blanchard, as you've heard earlier, and for each installment of our President's Lecture Series, we really aim to bring thought-provoking content from informed guests uh, whose work sparks both conversation and interest. And today is no exception. As we are leading up to the biggest night in Hollywood, the Oscars Awards, coming up sh shortly, what a fitting time to really look back um, at the biggest night in history, but more importantly, to look back at some of what is the untold story. Some of you are too young to remember Hattie McDaniel. As a matter of fact, she, was, she passed away in 1952, which was 10 years before I was born. So while I don't remember her personally, what I do remember is the fact that there were many times when my parents uh, would sit down and watch the movie Gone with the Wind, and they would watch it almost on an annual basis. Uh, so the reality is that my sister and I got a chance to actually see her on screen, uh, Hattie McDaniel, and, and how exciting that was for lots of reasons. So it's with, it's with a bit of nostalgia that uh, I enter this lecture today as an eager member of the audience, uh, as you all are. I'm often in awe at the resilience of those who came before us. Uh, born in 1893, less than 30 years after the legal ending of slavery in America, uh, Hattie McDaniel managed to forge out a career in acting, singing, and even comedy. She won the admiration of many and was the first African American to ever receive an, an Academy Award. Today, we will learn more about that story. Hattie McDaniel's story. We will get a chance, if you will, to peek behind the curtain and we will learn the price she paid for her role in history, the price of opening the doors for so many others. Uh, today's guest, which you're gonna learn more about very shortly, Ms. Rashonda Tate, is no stranger to the power of stories uh, and more importantly, the power of history um, and the importance of giving voice to silent narratives. Uh, before I take my seat, I simply want to say thank you so much, uh, Ms. Tate, for being with us here today. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more about Hattie McDaniel. Um, and the person that will get an opportunity to introduce 
formerly um, Ms. McDaniel, uh, Ms. McDaniel, who, no, <laughs> that won't happen, Ms. Tate, <laughs> um, uh, is uh, someone that's no stranger to the UHD community, and that's Ms. Deborah Mag Magow, McGoy. I always get that screwed up. Uh, she serves as our Assistant Vice President of University Relations, but even more, uh, she's got a relationship with Ms. Tate and was responsible for helping to bring her here. So uh, let us do the honors in uh, introducing now Ms. Deborah Mag Magoy. <laughs> I know, I've only been here six months. It's, it's, it's a hard name. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard. Okay, <clears throat> I first met Rashonda Tate more than 30 years ago. Yes, time flies. When we were both hardworking reporters out there in the streets of Houston, we were covering fires and floods and everything else the city could present. I work for Channel 11 News. Rashonda was my colleague, but mm, competitor over at Fox 26 KRIV. And I knew that when I would see her out on a story, I knew that she would be there to do a very good job and that I would not have to worry about her needling me out of the way to get her mic under the nose of somebody very important. So that was a good feeling. Rashonda was going to be nice, calm, humble, dignified. I also knew that she probably wasn't going to be in TV news for the long haul. <laughs> Since then, I have admired, watched, and literally envied her rise to her true calling, which is as a gifted and celebrated writer and novelist. Rashonda is a dynamic storyteller whose prose, I've read it, right, jumps off the page with such ferocity that few of her more than 50 books, okay, it's really 53, a <laughs> couple have been turned into movies. Let the church say amen. amen, all right, all right. Her book with that very title was made into a movie directed by actor, and I didn't say actress, I said actor, Regina King, and produced by Pastor T.D. Jakes and the multi-talented Queen Latifah. Rashonda is a sought after motivational speaker, an award winning poet, the recipient of the NAACP Image Award for outstanding literature for her book, Say Amen Again. She stays completely busy. She's the managing editor for the Houston Defender newspaper. Y'all reading that newspaper? That's right. And a radio news anchor and talk show host for KTSU 90.9 FM. Of course, she's a professional editor, ghostwriter, and literary consultant. She's got all those skills. And let's add businesswoman and entrepreneur to this list. Rashonda is co-founder of a boutique publishing company, Brown Girl Books, which produces quality books from fresh voices and has a roster of more than 40 authors. The company is branching out to produce content for film, TV, and the web. So, y'all got some ideas? Yes. Yeah, this is probably the lady you'd like to speak with. She's a graduate of UT Austin. We're not gonna hold that against her. <laughs> and she's also an AKA member and a Jack and Jill member with the Missouri City Chapters. You know, those are fancy organizations, y'all. And a married mother of a blended family of five children, 16 to 24 years old. The Queen of Sugar Hill is Rashonda's debut historical fictional novel. She told me she spent three years researching Hattie McDaniel, and she feels she knows everything there is to know about her. The book, which was released January 30th, is receiving terrific reviews, and it's a book you can't put down. The University of Houston downtown is pleased to present an incredible talent and a woman we should all admire, Rashonda Tate. Well, good afternoon. 
So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this, this woman that I just have grown to absolutely love. It's funny, when I finished this book, again, I had been working for three years. I told my sister, I was so excited. I told my sister, Hattie is pleased. And my sister said, I, I thought she was dead. I said, she is, <laughs> but I am confident that she is pleased. Uh, again, this, is, this book is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I am, like many people, when I first saw Gone with the Wind, I did not like it. Uh, my grandmother, it was her favorite movie. And I saw it and I watched with disdain. And my grandmother said, well, what's the issue? And I said, well, Hattie McDaniel is, she's playing this maid and she's um, so, uh, so stereotypical. And my grandmother said, she's playing a maid. I am a maid. Why are you looking at her with such disdain? And then she said, plus it's 1939. Who would you like her to play, Scarlett O'Hara? And it was then that I started thinking of Hattie McDaniel in a different light. And over the years, I just continued to keep her in my heart, if you will. And I eventually decided that I wanted to research more and learn more about her. And once I took off my 21st century lens, I was amazed at the woman, the legend that was Hattie McDaniel. And I think that's the problem is so many of us look at the past through our 21st century lens. And we miss the dynamic story of women like Hattie McDaniel. So what I wanted to do is just kind of take you through a little bit of her story, the Oscars and a hidden history, Hollywood legend, Hattie McDaniel. So uh, most people know her as Mammy. This is how she came to be. She was Mammy in Gone with the Wind. She ran the Terra Plantation. And that is her with Vivian Lee, who played Scarla O'Hara. So that is who people saw Hattie McDaniel as. The Academy Awards is where she became known. They happened in February 29th of 1940. That's Hattie McDaniel and her date at Fyodor. She attended the Academy Awards, which had never, been ha had never happened before. In fact, they had never even had a black person nominated. First of all, in order to get the role as Mammy, Hattie McDaniel went to the audition in her maid's uniform. And this position, uh, this role as Hattie was one of the most sought after in the country. When word got out that Gone with the Wind was being made, every black actor, actress wanted that role. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt even called the producer, David O. Selznick, and wanted her maid to audition for the role of Hattie McDaniel. Well, ultimately, Hattie McDaniel won it, and then she wanted to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. That had never happened before. No black person had ever been nominated. She convinced David O. Selznick to nominate her, and she was nominated against another Gone with the Wind actress, and she actually won. But the night of the ceremony, she was not allowed to attend because they had never had any African Americans at the Academy Awards. So David Selznick had to fight, he pulled some strings, and he got Hattie McDaniel able to attend the Academy Award of all the people that you see there. The Gone with the Wind cast is at the very front. Where's Hattie, you say? There she is. At the very, very back of the room, in the corner with her date, F.P. Yoder. But while we would look at that and say, that is ridiculous and that is so horrible that Hattie McDaniel is at the very back of the room, and it is. But Hattie McDaniel said, I'm in the room. It has never happened before other than janitors and wait staff that a black person has been in the room and I'm in the room. And that's what she chose to focus on that night. Now, it took her so long when she won to get to the front to make her acceptance speech that the music ran out. That's how far back she was. But she was presented the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress by Faye Bainter, who had won the previous year. And it was a historic moment. You know, the, the applause was tepid at first because many people there, uh, you know, this is something they hadn't seen. And they, as Hollywood was still a lot like the South, it wasn't progressive. And so uh, as the night wore on, people were a little bit they, realizing of the monumentalness of the moment. And Hattie was presented, she made her speech Selznick Studio had written her speech, and she ended up at the last minute deciding to deliver it from the heart. But did you know, in 1940, supporting actors only received plaques. So if you see pictures with this award here, that is the actual Academy Award that they gave supporting actors and actresses back in the, in the 40s and 50s. 
So Hattie McDaniel, actually, people think Gone with the Wind was her first role. She had been in 70 other films, 70. Uh, many of, of them were unaccredited, but the one in the middle is the one where she became friends with Clark Gable, that is China Seas. And Clark Gable, many people know him as the king of Hollywood. Hattie McD McDaniel knew him as her best friend. On the set, they became really good friends, and that's a friendship that lasted her entire life. But before we go a little bit more down her journey, I want to take you back to the beginning with Hattie McDaniel. She was born in Wichita, Kansas. That little shack there is um, her home in Wichita. She was the youngest of 13 children. Now, m many of the children died along the way, but that, um, that's where they lived in that little shack. And Otis, this is a picture of her brother. He fancied himself a producer, and he loved to entertain. They were born the, the children of former slaves. Both Hattie's father and mother were former slaves. And you'll see the little girl at the top amidst all of the, uh, the little white children. That's Hattie McDaniel. And she knew from a very early age that she wanted to perform. So she and her sisters, um, her, her brother Otis, he always got the family performing. So they formed a little minstrel act, and it was the McDaniel sisters. He had them touring around, and the mother did not want them. And her mother was very talented, but her mother was domesticated, and she believed that was her children's future as well. And so she didn't want them to perform, but no matter what she did, she couldn't stop that entertaining bug that was inside of them. A lot of people also don't know this. Hattie McDaniel was the first black woman to ever have been played on the radio. She produced 27 blues slides. Um, the slides are the same things as records. She produced those and was well known before she ever made a movie in Hollywood. In um, Sam's pick, Holly, uh, she was in, in 1930, a show called Showboat in 1929. And, and it was performing in Chicago and then the, the depression hit. And so the, they shut down. They had a performance in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it shut down. So Hattie McDaniel had to go get a job at this place. It's a popular place called Sam's Pick, only she worked in the ladies' room. She was a maid in the ladies' room. She wanted to sing. She wanted to perform, but she was a maid in the ladies' room. Until one night, they were about to close, and a bunch of soldiers came in, and they wanted to be entertained, and no one was there to entertain them. And Hattie McDaniel, long before you know, we knew what stay ready means, Hattie McDaniel stayed ready so you don't have to get ready. And she performed for those soldiers that night, and the rest, as they say, is history. For two years, she remained performing at Sam's Pick. But the, um, the, the depression had taken its toll, and eventually Sam's closed, and Hollywood, uh, she packed up and moved to Hollywood. Her sister and brother, a lot of people don't know, they were already in Hollywood as entertainers, Etta and Sam McDaniel. Sam McDaniel was in The Three Stooges. Um, he had a lot of, um, lot of roles, and he said, come on out, sister, and we'll find you some work. And so she went to, went to Hollywood and began living, working with her brother on a radio show called The Optimistic do -Nuts. She was known as High Hat Hattie. And it was just a comedy show that she kind of became known um, on. She appeared in more than 70 films, most of them as maids, servants, and slaves. But she was a comedian who loved performing. And then this was the, the movie that changed her life, Gone with the Wind. So again, she played um, the uh, Mammy. I don't even think they had a, had a real name for her. She was just Mammy. And she was Vivian Lay. Now, they auditioned together. And the chemistry that they had, they were the last two people to be hired for Gone with the Wind. The chemistry that they had was great. And so they were hired on set. And if anyone has seen the movie, it is, you know, one of the things that I didn't look at at the time is I was so focused on she's a maid instead of she's running that plantation. She was a powerful force even to be a, a maid in, 19, in the early 1900s. And so that is one of the things that put her on the map. Another thing that we did not look at with Hattie McDaniel is, I, I have this up here because this is a script. And I call Hattie McDaniel a quiet warrior because Hattie McDaniel made changes behind the scenes. This is one of the original scripts for Gone with the Wind. And it called for the N-word to be used in the movie. And Hattie McDaniel said, I'm not saying that. And she fought to have it taken out. 
And this was one of the biggest movies of its time that Hattie McDaniels was able to make a change with because she had a seat at the table. And we always think of our activists as loud and proud and, you know, power to the people. We're going to make a vocal, be vocal in our change. And Hattie McDaniel made quiet change with things like this. And there were several other things that she did on the set of the movie that she was, it was her way of bringing about change. It did not come without um, a protest. Hattie McDaniel uh, struggled with her role as Mammy because white people did not like her because they felt Mammy was too sassy. Black people did not like her because they felt that Mammy was too degrading and demeaning stereotypes. So black newspapers just pummeled, pummeled her. This, this article is her own people are messing her up. So this is the kind of stuff she faced on a regular basis. She would go to events only to be met by picketers saying you'd be sweet too under the whip and gone with the wind is bad for us. And so her thing was, I just want to perform. But this is the type of thing that she had to deal with all the time. She got to a point where she said, I'd rather play a maid for $700 than be a maid for $7. But the NAACP and a lot of black people at the time said, no, you, you do not need to play these roles. Hattie's thing was, well, what then should I play? Should I play Wonder Woman? Should I play a, an entrepreneur? Where do I go sign up for those roles? Because I would absolutely love to. But still, she, it was an ongoing battle, and it really cut her to her core. In fact, the NAACP, um, she went to war with the NAACP. I know you think those are two white men that she's with, but this man over here in the white suit is actually the president slash executive director of the NAACP, Walter White. And Walter, was he was very well-meaning, but his sole purpose was to get people like Hattie McDaniel off the air. He wanted, he felt that Hattie and other actors like her were demeaning. And so they smiled at this in this picture, but it was an ongoing fight all the time. In fact, he invited Hattie McDaniel to the NAACP convention in 1942. These are, this is an actual picture. Now, Hattie is invited. She thinks that she's about to be uh, invited to be honored. And instead, while she sits at the very front, they call, um, uh, he comes up on the stage, Walter White, and he says, I have been working with Hollywood to change the image of the actors. But today I want to honor one of these actors who is who we want to bring attention to. And he said, coming to the stage, and Hattie thought she was about to go up on stage. And he said, instead, this is who we want. And Hattie had to stand there with her head held high as Walter White demeaned her and said, Lena Horn is the woman that we want Hollywood to see. This is the image of beauty that we want the world to see for black people. And it was painful for Hattie. Um, all of you saw all of the people that were there. Lena didn't know she was about to be used as a pawn, but that was what he did. He said this was the standard of beauty that they wanted for black people at the time. These are some of um, Hattie's dearest friends. And at the top is Betty Davis. Then there's Louise Beavers, who played in It's a Wonderful Life, Clark Gable, Talila Bankhead, Bojangles Robinson, Ruby Dandridge, uh, Ruby Dandridge and um, Lillian Randolph, and Dorothy Dandridge. And so these are some of the close friends that helped Hattie navigate the journey of trying to find herself in Hollywood. Now, Hattie McDaniel says that you might have known her as Mammy, but she didn't want the world to know her as Mammy. So she was known for lavish parties. She always gave parties because she wanted to give back to young people. So this is a photo of her with all of these young people that she used to just invite to her home so that they can see how she lived. And she was notorious for her minks and dressing up because she wanted people to know she was more than Mammy. And that is Hattie McDaniel's story. She's more than Mammy. And that's what she wants me. Yes, she told me. She wants me to make sure that I let the world know. <laughs> so
So one of the things I love to do is just answer people's questions. Um, one, not only about my journey in researching Hattie McDaniel, but just if you have any questions about publishing and what I do in general. I wanted to say, especially because we are in an academic environment, in researching this, one of the biggest things I discovered is how erroneous the internet is. So if those of you that go to Google and think you're going to get all your answers to everything you're doing, I advise you to think again. When I first started out my research, I went searching on the internet for information about Hattie McDaniel, and I pulled up a lot. But then I wanted to verify it, trust but verify, and I couldn't verify some of the things. For example, Hattie McDaniel was, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, Anywhere, articles, Google, there they talk about her husband, George Langford, and how he died in a gambling accident. So when I went to research, I couldn't find George. Long story short, George Langford does not exist. Somebody wrote an article saying she was married to someone named George, and then someone else repeated that, and someone else copied that, and that has continued to go down in history, and it's not true. Even some historians, um, as I was doing research, got information wrong, because it seems like they just got it off the internet. And I was dumbfounded at the amount of information that was wrong on the internet. My husband used to say, you, you need to write and tell those historians they got it wrong. And I said, no, they have PhDs. They'll be looking like, lady, you just make stuff up. <laughs> but I really did. I went to research libraries. I went to the Census Bureau. And I really dug deeper than just trying to get all of my information online. So that's something to always be cognizant of as you're looking up information on, online. But at this time, I'd love to get any questions, if anyone has questions. Yes, yeah, so her story of uh, her, she has no children. Um, that is something that I deal with in the book because she desperately wanted children. And it is a tragic part of her story, what happened to her with her, with her um, trying to conceive and have children, so that is part of the book. She has a great, a great, great grandnephew who is working to keep her story alive. But other than that, she doesn't have any, any uh, family members, just some extended um, nephews and nieces. OK, and, we're going to okay. we're, we're, we'll have another question. We're going to use the mic so you can be picked up and we can have your voice recorded. Great. Hi, could you go into the, uh, the title of the book? Where does that come from? The, very good question. Um, the title of the book is The Queen of Sugar Hill. In um, 19, the 1940s, at, right after Hattie won the award and she made a lot of money as uh, working with Gone with the Wind, she moved into a neighborhood in Los Angeles. It had been her dream. It was initially called the West Adams District. And they, it became known as Sugar Hill, named after the neighborhood in New York. So Hattie moved into this big mansion. She's excited. It's, it's huge. It's beautiful. She paid $10,000 above asking cost. And she was one of the first African Americans to move into the area. Well, she was followed by several other uh, affluent blacks. And the whites who lived there did not want them there. And apparently, there was a law in Los Angeles called restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants means that you cannot sell your home to anyone who is not of pure European descent. And so the attorneys filed a class action lawsuit against all the black people in the neighborhood to get them kicked out of their home. And again, this is the 19, early 1940s, and so it was unheard of to take white people to court. Well, Hattie McDaniel stepped up and said, oh no, <laughs> you're not getting me out of my house I've worked too hard for. And she led the efforts as they went to court to fight restrictive covenants, and they actually won the case. And it became the catalyst for a Supreme Court case that struck down restrictive covenants. So people don't even know that the reason you can live anywhere you want, black and brown people, is because Hattie McDaniel fought to get rid of restrictive covenants. And that is why the Queen of Sugar Hill is the title. More questions? OK, well, let me ask you one question. How did you write this book? You always you, you talked earlier today about how you write a book. I mean, she's written 53 books. You know, she's a mom, she's working. How do you even find the time and what's your process for writing a novel? And this is my 54th book. 
<laughs> you know what? So I am able to do it all that I do because I believe every minute you spend talking about what you don't have time to do could be spent doing it. And I am a firm believer in utilizing every spare moment. We're stuck in traffic a lot in Houston. So I am in my car. I have a, an app on my phone that's called Audio Memos. I will dictate a chapter as I'm sitting in traffic. I will dictate a chapter as I'm waiting on the doctor. And then I send it to a transcription service called Timmy that transcribes it. And by the time I make it in the house, they've sent it back to me. And there's my first draft. And I was telling Deborah, we actually use that now in reporting. You can use that in, in everything. It is just a way to help you move your story along. Now, what, what happens from that is that's just my first draft. So now I can go in and clean my story up. And that's what I do. I go in, I clean it up. I, do, I believe that good books are not written, they're rewritten. And so I go and I start there and I do several drafts over and over and I come back with fresh eyes. And then that's how I'm able to get all of my books done. Um, hi. So I just want to know what made you start writing and how was it? Very good question. So I have always had this active imagination. I loved making up stuff. My mother called it lying. Um, <laughs> but for me, it was just this active imagination. And I was in the fifth grade here in Houston, and I wrote an article. I mean, we had to write an, uh, an essay on what you did on your summer vacation. And I wrote how I grew up in the ghetto and was just witness to drive-by shootings and elderly ladies getting mugged and just how difficult life was for me. And my teacher called my mother and said, well, Rashawn is a good student. Let me know if I can do anything. And my mother said, ghetto? Drive-bys? What are you talking about? We live in a nice middle-class neighborhood. And my teacher said, well, why did you make that up? And I said, I don't know. I went to summer camp, and this just sounded so much better. <laughs> and it was at that point when they explained the difference between fact and fiction. <laughs> and so my mother would always tell me that if, I, if it comes out of my mouth, it's a lie. If I write it down, it's a story. <laughs> so I just started writing them down. Um, I'd, I would write all the time, loved writing. And my first piece was published at age 15. There used to be a magazine called True Confessions. Now, if anyone's a little older in here um, and knows anything about True Confessions, it probably was one step down from Playgirl. <laughs> so a 15-year-old had no business reading, let alone writing for this magazine. But I wrote an article called I Stole My Sister's Husband. <laughs> I left off the fact that I was 15 and she was 12. <laughs> but they published it, and they sent me a check for $150. <laughs> I never cashed the check because I was too scared to tell my mom where the money came from. <laughs> but that was my first published piece. Um, and then I went to the University of Texas at Austin, and I graduated. And I was a journalist. I, I told myself I, wanted to, I was a serious journalist. And I interviewed for the National Enquirer, yes, the paparazzi. And I had no intention on going to work for them, but they offered me a free trip to come out and see the facility in West Palm Beach, Florida. So I said, a free trip to Florida, I'll take it. And I interviewed with everyone, they loved it, and they offered me a job. And I said, oh no, I'm a serious journalist. I cannot <laughs> work for the National Enquirer. And they said, please, and they gave me all of the, the reasons I should work. And I'm, no, I'm a serious journalist. And, then they said, well, starting salary is 120000 So I said, well, when y'all want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> and I worked for the National Enquirer for a year, but I hated it. I hated digging up dirt and gossip on celebrities and just told myself I was put on this earth for a calling greater than this. So I moved back to Houston and began working um, behind the scenes at Channel 13 and for The Defender. And I wanted to be on air. And I used to watch Melanie Lawson go out on stories. And I would always, uh, I, I can admit this because I've told Melanie this, but I'd say, I hope she trip and break her legs. So, <laughs> because I was like Hattie, I stayed ready. Uh, and then, you know, then it just dawned on me. Say, you out here wishing bad things on good people because you aren't doing what you want to do. Uh, and Melanie was actually the one that helped me get my first on-air job. But long story short, that's how I started writing. <laughs>
You are amazing. Let me say that first. Um, um, I'm a, a, a UHD alumni, but I also work in broadcasting. I'm currently on air on radio. So when I saw you were going to be here, I was amazed. Because like 20 years ago, I think I stumbled upon a book. It may have been in the promotions department, a free copy that you may be sent to the station, but I found you. So when I heard you were going to be here, I was so excited. Uh, my, you've answered all of my questions already. So this one just came. How did you decide how much fact and how much fiction you would put in this particular book? I read that pre-sample, uh, and I see she has a husband in the beginning of this. So, how much did you, how did you decide how much fact and how much how much fiction? Very good question. Um, I everything that is the foundation of this book is facts, and I wanted to make sure that I stuck to that because what happens for a lot of people when you're reading historical fiction, it's kind of like when you're watching a Lifetime movie based on a true story. You're Googling as you're going along because you want to know what's true and what's not. So what I didn't want to do is have you spend you know, 30 minutes Googling something only to find out it wasn't true. So the foundation of the story are, is all facts. So she did, in fact, have four husbands. And the fiction comes in and filling in the blanks. So for example, the night of the Academy Award, all of the, um, the cast members for Gone with the Wind went out to a club. That's a fact. They, couldn't, they were ready, excited, and ready to go inside, and the club owner would not allow Hattie McDaniel to come in. And that is a fact. The fiction comes in, we don't know exactly what he said to Hattie McDaniel. So then that is where the fiction comes in. I come in filling in the blanks. But everything else that, it, that takes place in the book, all facts. The only thing that I did do is I take liberty in moving things around because I am encompassing so many years of her life into a short span. I move things around. For example, I open up with Clark Gable at the Academy Awards in 1940. He was not there because he had found out he, won he did not win. They, um, they, the uh, newspaper released an embargo and they told it early. So he uh, got out of his tux and was like, I'm not going since he didn't win. But I put him there because I wanted to set up. I only had so much time to set up his friendship with Hattie McDaniel. But I have a historical note in the book where I explain all of the liberties that I took so that people know what's fact and what's not. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a senior, I'm an MBA student here, and I just recently heard of Hattie McDaniel a few weeks ago watching an interview that Monique did mm -hmm. on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, close, Shay Shay, yes. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how do you bring about getting Hattie McDaniel's legacy to the newer generation who's not as affluent to her past as she it, the older generation yeah. or some, yes. And, and and it's not just it's not just you all. I've been on a, a, a tour. I've been on a 22 city tour. And I'm meeting older pe a lot of older people, uh, 50, 40, 50 years old, that don't know who she is. And that is part of what I'm trying to do with this book and with engagements like this is educating the world. My 16-year-old son, I, and I, it has taken me all of these times, all of these months of research, and I've been working on this three years. And up until you know, the book came out, he kept calling her Hattie LaBelle. <laughs> so I have work to do. <laughs> But what I'm trying to do is really get out there and let people know, because in, in 2020, when they had the whole cancel gone with the wind and cancel mammy movement, a lot of young people turned it off. Because if you look at it through your 21st century lens, it can be startling and it can have you saying, I don't want to see that type of thing. But what I really want to do is I don't want us to erase our history. And so it, part of my touring, um, I'm doing a lot of media, is just spreading the word about her legacy and letting people know about her. Because there's no reason we shouldn't know that she was behind getting restrictive covenants struck down. There's so much about what she did. And that's, you know, you, change, you let people know one group at a time. And that's, all, that's what I'm doing. I, um, I'm in a Facebook group, a Gone with the Wind Facebook group. I didn't even know this thing existed. But it's 40, over 40,000 people there. And I joined there, and I just I listened to the discussion, and I posted one day about how I did, used to not like Hattie McDaniel. And I was immediately attacked by people. They were like, hey, that's stupid, and how could you not like her? And she's this, and she's that. And they, they love her, but they couldn't understand how a, a young black girl could not like her. And so I said, you're entitled to your opinion, but here's why I didn't initially like her. I was a young girl looking at her through a different lens and wanting to see something else. 
And because I approached them in that manner, they came back with, wow, I never even thought about that. And it was mind after mind after mind that was being changed because instead of getting aggressive and immediately insulted, I was able to come at them in, in an educated manner and saying, look at it from a different perspective. So I'm just trying to educate people one person at a time. Well, welcome and good afternoon. Uh, with that said, I too um, had a little disdain for a lot of historical pieces like this. <clears throat> and given the current climate we're in with an assault on history, are there any other books in the wings, perhaps, that you're doing a series of legacies to bring awareness to those um, artists, um, historians, perhaps, that we have a misguided view of from the past? Absolutely. I have loved the discovery process. And so the book I'm working on now is on Hazel Scott. And a lot of people don't know who she is. And she was bigger, she was a jazz singer, and she was bigger than Billie Holiday, Sarah Vaughn. And she's the former wife of Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And she made so many, say, made such a difference in our communities. But because she spoke out, she used her position of power to speak out against injustice, they deemed her a communist and all but erased her from history. And so her story is fascinating. I'm like, how could we not know about this amazing lady? So I'm finding just woman after woman, story after story like that, that I, that's the area I'm in now. I'm like, I found my lane in just bringing light to these unsung heroes. You have another one too, right? Go ahead and tease that one. <laughs> yes, it is um, called, it's about a woman called Mary Allen Pleasant. And Mary Allen Pleasant was um, a, the, she funded the Underground Railroad. And people are like, well, how could she fund it? She was extremely rich. She was a maid. And she used to clean and work at oil, at, at um, country clubs where rich white oil men came. And she would clean and get, get their plates and listen for their tips on where they're investing all of their money. And she would silently go and invest her money. And so she did ev just followed everything they were doing. But because she was a black maid, she was deemed invisible. And she used that to her advantage. And she was able, she uh, funded the Underground Railroad. She was very well known in California. But I was like, how do we not know about her as well? So it is stories like that. That is also in the pipeline. I'm just finding one after another. Do y'all see those as movies? Yeah, don't you see? You could see it. Okay, more questions? You wanna answer? Okay, young writers. How many folks are young writers or aspiring writers? Don't you wanna know more about that process? Do you need to have, oh, I don't know, do you need to write an outline? And what do you do to get started to write a book? So you really have to start writing your book. The uh, I cannot tell you the number of people that come up to me and they'll say things like, do you have Oprah's number because she needs to buy my book. It is great. It's the best book you will ever read. And then they'll launch into what it's about. And then I'll say, oh, let me read it. Well, oh, I hadn't written it yet, but this is and that is that is what you see so often. So really, you, the first thing is to write the book. I started out by writing three pages a day, five days a week, no matter what. And I let myself, you know, stick to that guideline. One of my friends always says, your desire to write has to become greater than your resistance because life will always get in the way. If you have to wait for the perfect time, it will never happen. Something will always get in the way. So I set small goals and those three pages turned to 30 before I knew it and I was able to finish my book. So the first step in is, is to just write the book. And then don't sit around and wait on a major publisher. My publisher, when um, she used to always have a stack of manuscripts from the floor to the ceiling, and she would always say, I'm going to read those as soon as I get time. But she never had time. So I said, someone is sitting at home waiting on a publisher to validate their talents, and she hasn't even read it yet. Now, I self-published my very first book 
because I couldn't get a book deal. I got rejected left and right. I sent out so many, we call them query letters. I sent out query letters regularly and I got rejected left and right. I come home sometimes from places I hadn't even sent it. I'm a girl, don't send anything to us. But I believed in my story and I self-published it. And I'm an outside the box thinker. I know that you, writing book is only the, writing the book is only half the journey. The other half is figuring out how are you gonna get people to buy it? So I knew that I had to get people into the store to buy the book. There was just one problem, my book wasn't in the store. So how could I get it in the store? Well, for me, uh, an outside the box thinker, I would call a bookstore in Oklahoma City and say, hi, do you carry My Brother's Keeper? And, and by Rashonda Tate Billingsley, that was the name I was writing under. They say, nope, we don't have it, never heard of it. I'd call back about four hours later, hi, do you carry this book called My Brother's <laughs> Keeper? They say, no, we don't have that book, sorry. No joke, right before closing, I would call and say, I'm looking for this book called My Brother's Keeper. And they said, we don't have it, but we need to get it because everybody's calling about this book. And I did that in store after store, day after day, until um, the book just became a hit. And this, one of the same agents I had tried to reach out to before contacted me and said, there's a lot of buzz about your book. I was like, really? <laughs> And she got me a deal with Simon and Schuster. But I knew that I knew that the book had to be good. You can't create a book a buzz if you don't have a product to deliver. And so she read it and was like, "This is fabulous." I wanted to say that's what I've been trying to tell everybody. But she got me a deal with Simon and Schuster, and that's how I got published the very first time. Sorry, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. No, I'm going to ask all. this question of you. So I looked at my phone because I was like, of course I have books. I have a folder that says to write books, titles to write. What do you do when you get stuck in um, you've written out the outlines, you've started creatively writing. I get to a point where I'm like, that's too technical. Nobody's going to want to read that like that. I get bored in the writing to make it good. So what do you do when you get blocked or stopped in the your, your task to make it good. I don't get writer's block. People always ask me that. I don't get writer's block because I don't get paid unless I write. <laughs> so that's kind of the motivation for writer's block. But write through because the best invention ever made was that delete button. And so a lot of times people will sit down and they will try to write this. This is the Queen of Sugar Hill. You'll look at this and then you'll say, okay, let me write this. And then you'll, get, you'll stop after the first chapter because you're like, well, it doesn't sound like hers or... It, Good books aren't written, they're rewritten. And so get out of your own head thinking about, well, does this sound right? And get it all out on the page. I equate it to making gumbo. Even though my family's like, don't, don't eat her gumbo. Just, walk, just trust me on this. You put the roux down first. And then it's not good if you just eat the roux by itself. And you go back in and you slowly season and you slowly add all of the ingredients to make the best pot of gumbo. And that's how writing is. And that's the approach that you should take with it. So my question is, throughout this whole time you've been here, you've mentioned that you've been a journalist for a company that pays a lot, but you don't really enjoy. You've self-published a story that you believe in, and now you're writing a story about someone else and their legacy. Uh, my question would be, um, do, uh, how have you seen that your quality has been affected when you're writing books for a paycheck, for yourself, or for somebody else? Well, so if I was, were writing for a paycheck, I'd be digging up dirt and gossip on Beyonce right now. Um, but I have, to, I have to, one, be able to sleep at night. I have to be happy with what I'm doing. I, um, you know, it was great making 120. I was 21 years old when I was making that. And, you know, it was great for me to make that money. Now, my mother was so ashamed of where I worked. She used to tell people I worked for a top secret government agency. They'd say, How, how's Rashonda? Oh, I can't talk about what she's doing. Um, but, but I had to be able to be happy with what I'm doing. And so I'm a firm believer in, in finding what you would do for free. I would write books about Hattie McDaniel and travel the world and do all of that for free because I love it. The great thing is I don't have to. And so that's what you do. You find whatever it is that is your passion. Now, it might not come right away. I, when I was on Fox here, um, if Fox still rolling, I'll, I'll say that story. For, no, <laughs> I, I worked at Fox, and it was, it was time for me to go. 
because it was my time to really do my books. I was doing both of them. I was staying at Fox for the paycheck because they paid very well, but my passion lies somewhere else. And I don't know where you all take your problems, but I take mine to my knees and I would pray for direction. And God would say, OK, here's a sign. I, this is what I need you to do and leave the job. And I'd say, but God, direct deposit. <laughs> I, I can't leave yet. And so it was one thing after another. Um, and I was not happy at the job until I had a plan on how to survive without depending on the direct deposit. So I stepped out on faith and I haven't looked back. But you can't just go home and quit your jobs. That's the last thing I want. Y'all going home, turning in your notice to, to U of H downtown here saying, that lady told us to quit. No, that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying have a plan to follow your passion. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Uh, so um, I'm an aspiring writer. Um, um, I've done a few projects with film and things of that nature, but one of the things I wanted to ask you is, what advice would you give me? I'm wanting to create a project for my grandmother. My grandmother's passed, uh, but she used to write these short stories, so she had a whole pen name that she would do, and she would tell it, read us the stories, and so she left all that to me when she passed away, and so me being the creative of the family, my sister was like, here you go, this, this, these are yours, and they're beautiful stories, so with that being said, I want to create a book that talks about my grandmother's life, but it's so sensitive because, of course, we talk about it, we start crying. Uh, so what approach should I take when it comes to just starting? <laughs> just do it and, and remind yourself of the fact that she, you, you want to tell her story. And if you got to cry, if you have to sit at your computer and go, ah, do it. Just get it out. And that is the, the main thing. It has to be pour out of you and onto the pages. Uh, if you overthink it, it'll never come out. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. Two more questions. There's one there. You've had three bites at that apple. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get on over here. You were mentioning how that half of a project for when you're writing is for it to be something that people want to read. Um, when you're covering such a someone's life, um, how do you determine what stays? What kind of process did you have, or what 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 makes the book and what doesn't um, in terms of just keeping it something that people want to write? And then the second part of that is: Do you ever share your writings with anyone and ask for feedback? Is there anyone in your life that you let kind of review your work and share? Yes. Yeah, so uh, to the latter question, I do. I have a, a group of, of writers, um, a, a community, a village, if you will. It's four of us. And we it's people that, you know, will be honest, not that person that everything you give them. They're like, oh, that's good. You know, you really want someone that's going to give you great feedback. I have friends that say, what is this mess? Uh, and so that'll have me reevaluate things. So you definitely need those um, in your life. Um, and then your first question was? The first one, the first one was, how do you decide what stays and what goes? Oh, great. How do I decide what? I really do. I want to tell, this, there's so much more to her story. She had so many war efforts. And I did, I wrote it initially. But in the rewriting process, I felt like it slowed the story down. So I said, that, well, this is something that can go. Um, her friendship with Clark Gable was just amazing. And I do have a lot of that in there. But a lot of it had to be cut out because this is her story and not Clark's story. So I take those types of things into account. There's also, a, you know, I struggled with, so Hattie had four marriages. Um, after her fourth one fell apart, Hattie um, became part of something called the Sewing Circle. And the Sewing Circle was in Hollywood. It was a group of wives who were married to men that they weren't, the, it was a lavender marriage. And so they met in this sewing circle, these women did, to not sew. I'm going to just leave it at that. It was, a, it was a little gathering. And Hattie went to one, and she had somebody that she was with. And so I struggled. You know how you were with your grandmother, and there's some things you just didn't want to know? So I struggled with, should I include that? But it is part of her story. And so I did, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it because of that. You know, just for me, that was just something that, you know, it's like your grandmother's door. You just want to shut the door. Okay. We're going to 
go ahead on and any other questions? Last chance, last chance. Okay, go ahead. Well, last question. If if you had the you know the choice, who would you pick to, in Hollywood now to play Hattie McDaniel in her biopic? Very good question. Um, before she even did the color purple, I saw Danielle Brooks as as you got a number because I would I would love to. Yeah, but I saw Danielle Brooks. But one of the things that I've learned in this process um, from having my previous books is that a great actress can make the role hers. Um, in my previous movie, Let the Church Say Amen, Layla Rashawn, she's a she's an actress who was in Waiting to Exhale and they wanted her to play the, fir the first lady. And she's always played these sultry women. And when they first told me she was playing it, I was like, sunshine <laughs> and Layla Rashawn is, but she was amazing. And so I learned then that a good actor can make, make the role their own. But if I had my way, it would definitely be Danielle Brooks. And then I want to have a role in there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Again, if we can give just one more round of applause for Rashonda Tate. Thank you. And on behalf of the university, a little, a little parting gift. So, Thank you, but, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you so Thank much. You.